All right. Um, as you can see, we're having a little technical difficulties, but I'll, uh, um, we'll work around them. So uh, my name is Christian Hernandez. I'm part of the Red Hat Cloud, uh, Cloud Platforms BU. Um, my social handle, GitHub, Kubernetes Slack, is uh, ChristianH814. So um, you can hit me up there um, in either one of these avenues. I'm usually pretty responsive. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about GitOps, the holy grail of, uh, of DevOps. So um, I'm going to be going first over kind of just defining what uh, DevOps is a little bit, um, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and then I'll kind of go over the history of GitOps um, and how it all fits in. I also had a demo planned, but since I'm not using my laptop, I guess we can use that demo time for uh, questions and answers, or um, I can show you on the outside. If you like, so. Um, so first of all, what is DevOps, right? So, what DevOps is really is like a, a it's a methodology and it's practices, right? So it's um, it's not a department, right? So I had a um, long time ago when um, we first started doing DevOps in, in my previous company, uh, there was a guy that would say, "Oh, the, these two departments will never work together, right?" It, it, it's not one, and I had to like explain, "No, no, it's." It's not a department, it's, 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 a, it's a way to work, right? Um, dev and ops work really closely together, right? Um, before there was, a, there was an idea of, you know, throw it over the fence, right? You know, I, I develop something and, you know, I package it up, throw it over the fence is the ops guy's problem to deploy, manage, do all that, right? So now this is more of a, a, a methodology of working together, right? Um, being able to um, solve problems and, uh, no longer throw throw the uh, throw the code over the fence, as it were, um, and it's meant really to shorten the development life cycle, right? So you, there was a lot of talks today. I just uh, listened to a talk on Tekton um, about uh, CI/CD, right? Development life cycle, uh, you know, why that's important for fast delivery, and really DevOps is a way to um, deliver those things uh, rapidly, right? Um, um, it's also meant to have higher quality software, right? So when when everyone is is working together. Um, the uh, the issues that come up can be fixed uh, quicker is, is what the idea is really, and what I like to what, what I've actually seen out there is that the application stack now is seen as a whole responsibility right so no longer is like you know again I drew the analogy of throwing the code over the fence is no longer is like okay you know now now it's their problem now it's the the, the whole stack as a whole is seen as like an atomic unit. Right from the um, from the development all the way down to the infrastructure component is all seen as um, a component. So, uh, so when I talk about DevOps, is I'm, I'm kind of using these uh, methodology. You can uh, agree or disagree or whatever, but just in the context of, of this talk, this is how I'm going to view DevOps. So, um, and re really, how did we get here? Right. So there, there's there was the the buzzword of DevOps has been around for a while, but really. Uh, Really, it's really come into fruition in the past, I would say, five years or, or so. Um, and um, and re really, how did we get here? Right. So, um, I was I was debating on where where to start this. Um, how do we get here? Right. I, I was gonna maybe maybe start of um, you know um, in the times where we're racking racking servers, but really, this this all started where virtualization. Right. Is is really when we started getting into the uh, the idea of a rapid development. Um, so with virtualization came with the idea of like snapshots and cloning. Um, and with that, you have really like a template of what, um, what the infrastructure looked like for your application, right? You, you, would, you would build a server uh, with all its components and libraries, um, and you would clone those, right? Like this is my application foo, and that's the server for application foo, and this is how I'm gonna stamp them out. Um, and there was a lot of tools for, uh, for this automation, right? Um, uh, tools like uh, Puppet Chef, later on Ansible. I know I've used Chef um, exclusively in my, in my former, uh, um, former life. Um, and those uh, tools were, were, were made to automate a lot of those, right? Especially with virtualization and, and some of those cloud instances, right, like AWS. Um, you can really have this, in, like, this idea of infrastructure as code. Right, you can define what your infrastructure looks like uh, programmatically, right? Um, 
the kind of challenges that I really came up with that uh, is that you still get the idea of, of a one-to-one -one relationship, right? So you, you really get the idea of, okay, I have, um, I have a server, and, and I'm cloning it now, but, but that whole server is still defined as the application, right, as part of the application. This server, it's, 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 eventually it still turns into, into a pet, right? You, have the, you heard that, that phrase, pets versus cattle. You still have that idea of like this VM is still a pet because it's still specific to the application, right? So um, all of these tool sets gave birth to what we call an SRE now. Um, so SRE, you know, before I said that DevOps isn't a, um, uh, a, a, a department, if it was, the SRE would be, they would be part of that department, right? Or they would at least spearhead those, uh, that department if it was one. Um, but the, these are specialized people that know the application. So uh, when I said before, the application stack as an atomic unit, um, these people know that entire stack. Right, so they're really an extension of dev and an extension of operations. They, um, they really take care of the application once it's up and running. They, they submit patches, they, they, they monitor, they do all of those things that need to be done for that application stack. So, um, and that's kind of like the, uh, the, the, the progression. Then after virtualization came uh, this thing called Docker, right? So. Um, big buzz, right, of, of Docker uh, before. Um, what Docker really did is it took the concept of uh, LXCs, Linux containers, and simplified it, right? They wrote an interface to be able to, um, like, uh, package and build these containers. Um, I, I remember when I first saw Docker, I was, like ma many of you, I was like blown away. I was like, oh, now this, this changes the game. And it actually, I, I think it really did. Um, you're, you're able to, um, to build these containers uh, readily and easily. And actually, they wrote a, a really nice workflow for developing um, uh, applications and packaging those up, right? Because they give you a, an idea of bundling your, their, uh, your application, everything, right? Um, um, all the dependencies, everything needed to run the application is built into this, uh, this, this atomic unit, right? And we talked about, I talked about atomic unit a little bit before. Um, and um, it's really, Containers is really nothing but a, um, uh, it isolates uh, processes, right? It isolates um, by processes and namespaces inside the kernel, right? So no longer do you need um, uh, the entire operating system in order to run your application. You just need the bits that you need to run the run application. And with the, the, the isolation inside um, kernel namespaces, or in C groups and all, the, all that nice stuff that you get with Docker, you're able to now run, you, you actually get multi-tendency now. So you can run multiple applications without having to worry about, oh, um, I need this version of the library compiled versus this version. Um, and now you're able to run those two different versions right inside, inside, the, um, uh, inside the operating system. So uh, they're immutable, right? So um, which, which is really cool because uh, before, with with VMs and Puppet and you know Ansible, you get the problem with drift, right? So um, you get the uh, problem with drift until like you run that that sync that makes everything um, uh, what the, in the state that you want it, right? So here with containers, they don't really change, right? You say I want this you, since since with tagging, you say I want this version, this SHA to run. Um, that doesn't really change, right? It, it, so they're they're um, um, they're immutable from that fact. The you're able to run it the way you run it runs on your laptop is the way it runs on a server, right? So that that's that's I, I think that's very very powerful, especially with dev, DevOps, especially with that idea of throwing things over the fence. Um, even if you're still doing that, right? Now you know exactly what you're throwing over the fence. Um, it runs the same. So, you know, the only thing really changes is the environment uh, underneath, right? So. so, right, problem solved, right? All the problems are solved, right? So now when you build an application, it's easy, right? Docker made a, a good interface, Docker build, run, right? My app, version one. And uh, with the same interface, you can run it, right? Docker build, Docker run, easy command line interface. Um, and now you can actually see how um, you can start plugging that in into, okay, now that I built 
and I run this container, I can run it anywhere, physical, virtual environment, private, public cloud, all that good stuff. Um, and then you can also see how you can plug that in to your CI CD pipeline, right? So you have a you know, developer, and then uh, you have a source code repository, and then you have some sort of CI CD engine, Jenkins or Tekton, um, and that builds the container, and then you can then deploy that container. So it, it's, it's starting to come together, right? So, but application stacks are rarely that simple, right? So you know, even the most simple uh, application comes at least with the front end, back end, and a database, right? Maybe you have a caching layer. Um, so they're more complex than just a few containers, right? So you usually have a f you know um, usually have a few servers running uh, a few application stacks over a dozen servers, right? Um, so now you think, okay, cool. Um, I can do, uh, okay, I could build the front end, back end, um, database, cache, messaging, whatever you need for the application. Um, you, I, I built that the same way, you could think, right? And then when you run it, then you have to you know, kind of think, okay, well, I run my front end, well, now I need two front ends, right? Because you, know, you want your HA, so I have two front ends and I need to make sure I link it to the back end. Well, now I have two back ends, right? Because I want that HA, so I want, I want to make sure I link that to my database and caching system. Um, I want to make sure um, my caching system is linked to the DB. And you just kind of just have to keep all that in mind, right? So this, this is one application stack. So now you have that one application stack and you have a way to link it and okay, well then, but now when you want to, that's fine if you want to deploy it to like, you know, maybe five servers, right? Maybe even 10 servers. Um, but what if you have dozens of applications over across hundreds and hundreds of servers? And that, then, then it becomes maybe not that manageable, right? So um, as you all may have guessed, the answer to that question mark right there is um, it's Kubernetes, sorry, these slides were out of order. Um, it's Kubernetes, right? So Kubernetes came in and um, really answered the, the, following, uh, the following slide, right? So you need more than just containers. So just containers itself is not solving anything, right? You need scheduling, security, um, health management, uh, persistence, you know, all that stuff, right? So you need more than just um, running containers and this is where Kubernetes comes into place, right? So Kubernetes takes care of all of that for you, right? So I have a container. I want to um, be able to deploy that container, the application stack across you know, hundreds of servers, and I want to be able to link them all together. I want to be able to do health checks. I want to be able to do um, uh, uh, rollouts, deployments, right? All that stuff Kubernetes takes care of for you. So. All right, cool, now that we have Kubernetes, um, that solved a lot of that, uh, that problem itself, right? So now, um, Kubernetes really, just to, from a, from a high level, um, is it really a de declarative way to describe your infrastructure or deployment, application deployment, right? So um, it's in YAML and JSON, right? So really anyone can read it, like, right? Even the ops guys can read it. Um, it, it's you know you, you may have hundreds of <laughs> hundreds of lines of YAML, but at least you know you can read it. Whereas, um, you know, it, before when using tools like Puppet and Chef and even Ansible to an extent, um, you really have to learn the language or learn. It's like a coding scheme more than in. Um, it's it's not as there's a learning curve there, right? There's still a, a small learning curve with YAML and JSON, but it's e you know you can easily read it. Um, yeah, yes. Oh, okay, yeah, let me take this off here. Is it hard? There we go. Is that better? No? <laughs> Maybe it's this thing. Is that better? Okay, I think it was that thing. Maybe. Or is it still, hello? Better? A little bit? All right, I'll try not to move. All right. <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, Kubernetes really, um, what it what it really does is monitor state, right? So you you dec um, it takes the desired state and the current state and it reconciles it. So um, it'll be things like I want, you know, three instances of my application running, and it sees two, it'll spin up another container to meet that, right? So it's um, it really has a it it has a control loop that basically monitors state your declarative state 
versus a running state reconcile. High level, right, is that easy. It's not just for containers anymore, right? So with the, um, uh, with the introduction of CRD, uh, CRDs, custom resource definitions, um, you can really program anything into it, right? So you can, if you know a little Go, we could pretty much program anything into a CRD. Um, and CRD, custom resource definition. So it's um, just real quick from a high level, CRD is a way to program things into Kubernetes without having to write it directly into, um, uh, into the, uh, the, the tree. Right, so it's, it's basically like an extension of Kubernetes, right? So you can say, so like there's things like pod deployments, you can write databases, right? And you, whatever databases is, is whatever you define it as. Um, and you can further get further automation with operators, right? So this is um, um, just from a high level. Operators is writing operational knowledge into your CRDs. So if there's a, there's a talk on operators, I'd recommend you guys um, to go check that out. Um, so it, it, it's really, um, uh, it, it's really cool technology to be able to automate a lot of this stuff for you. So, um, so just my thought, Kubernetes, high, high, high level, it abstracts the underlying infrastructure. So um, I attended a talk long time ago. So um, this, this will tell you how long ago it was. It was a, a Kelsey Hightower, but it, it was back when he was working at CoreOS. That's how long the talk ago was. Um, and just talking about Kubernetes uh, v1, right? So um, 1.0. Um, he, he I think he explained it, uh, said something very um, elegant, that how would you design a system if I took your SSH keys away? Right. So as an admin, as an operation, um, as a developer, if I took your SSH keys away, how would you design a system? And really that's what Kubernetes is. It abstracts the um, underlying infrastructure so that way you can interact with the infrastructure and the, 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 the VMs, the, the instances really just become a method to run containers. And there's really no need, need for you to SSH in, right? That's the idea. So um, I think that explains it really well. So if I Imagine I took your SSH keys away, so Kubernetes is, right? So, how does GitOps fit all in, all, <laughs> um, in all this, right? So now that um, I went to, uh, through, the, uh, through that whole history and that whole um, thing about Kubernetes, what is GitOps, right? So GitOps, very similar to DevOps, is a, uh, is a series of methodologies and practices, right? Um, the idea is, is that you use Git as a canonical source of truth everything in your infrastructure. So with Kubernetes, um, before you, you had, um, like I said before, everything's defining YAML and JSON. We'll just store that YAML and JSON in Git. The whole thing. The idea with GitOps is even the, um, the, the platform itself, all, even the Kubernetes itself, all that, export all that and put it in Git, and that becomes your canonical source of truth. So um, any changes, or um, actually, let me backtrack a little bit. The entire system is described declaratively, right? So versus, so you're, you're, talking, you're talking about a, um, a series of facts versus a series of instructions, right? So that, that's it's a small, a small um, um, distinction, right? You're, you're thinking about like Ansible, Puppet, um, Chef. Those are a set of instructions versus GetOps. The idea is this is a set of facts, right? So get out, GetOps. Um, says like, this is how the, my infrastructure looks like, everything, right? So any changes you want, whether you're an operations guy, developer, whatever, I need to do a pull request, right? So I want to change the scale of my application, pull request. I want to add another node in the infrastructure, that's a pull request. So everything is um, declared um, inside of Git. So that's, that's the idea with GitOps, right? Software can be used to reconcile differences, right? So this, th this doesn't have to be anything special. Um, there are tools out there, right? But you can actually use things like Puppet, Chef, um, Ansible um, to reconcile those changes, right? You can even use a shell script. Um, but there are tools out there. Um, with two of the biggest one is uh, Flux CD and Argo CD. Um, I'll be talking mostly about Argo CD. Um, but uh, you can use software to reconcile those changes. 
and um, some of these tools like Argo and, uh, and Flux, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, uses CRDs, right? So it takes advantage of the control loop that's built inside Kubernetes to be able to um, reconcile those differences for you. So, um, and um, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but changes can be automatically applied, right? So with that, with that process, right? The automatic changes, right? So some of the, the benefits of using GitOps is that since you're storing everything in Git, all of a sudden you get this convenient audit trail. Right? You, you, you know exactly what changes were made, when, and by whom. Um, so you get um, the compliance and stability of, of, um, of leveraging your, your, uh, your source control management that you already have in place, right? So you get reliability as well. Um, uh, consistency and standardization, right? So since you're using GitOps, um, you know that this is the, the way to do it, right, in, in your environment. Whether you're in dev, staging, production, whatever, the way to get things through is through, uh, through Git, through pull requests, right? Um, a lot of people call that operations by pull requests, ops by pull requests, so. Um, and you get that standardization, you know, across, across, your, uh, um, across your environment, right? So generally makes life easier, right? So um, it's, it's as easy as, oh, you need to change just to submit that pull request, right? Just it just makes life easier. Um, it speeds up recovery time, right? So I read, I read this article by the guys at WeWorks that someone accidentally deleted their infrastructure. Like, you know, it sounds weird, but like stuff like that happens. I know I've done blunders in my, in my career as well. Um, but someone actually didn't know what they were doing. They actually deleted their, the entire infrastructure um, and they brought it back in 15 minutes. Uh, just by applying the GitOps practices, right? So, um, and GitOps really becomes a way to manage your Kubernetes infrastructure, right? Whether you're running Kubernetes or OpenShift, it becomes a way um, uh, to manage that system. It's how do you manage your Kubernetes system? A lot of people say, I, I just use GitOps, and that's how I manage uh, my, my Kubernetes system there, so. So if I'm storing everything in a repo, right, how, how is that repo laid out, right? So um, some of the things, and some of these things I, I've gotten by uh, attending some talks, um, mostly by the WeaveWorks guys, um, but these are some of the things I pilfered from uh, those talks is that uh, only use one repo, right? So like you'll have a repo called foo. You won't have foo.-stage as one repo, foo-prod in another repo, foo-dev in another repo. You'd have uh, just one repo, um, and you'll use branches. So you use a branch uh, to determine what environment you're in or what stage you're in, however you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna design that system. Um, you'll use one branch. Um, use protected branches. So protected branches is important, right, in case of accidental change, accidental deletion, um, use um, code review, you know, all those best practices that you should use in Git, uh, when you're using Git. Use it the, the same in GitOps, it's the same idea, right? Um, Leverage customize, right? So um, there, there's, a, there's a few ways to do things like overrides, right? So for example, if you wanna do like, a, like an AB deployment, blue-green deployment, um, or you wanna change scale, right? So you have multiple clusters. In one cluster, you want five instances running, and the other one you want, I don't know, maybe three or four. Uh, if you're using the same production repo, how do you overwrite that? So you do overrides and um, things, with things by using a customize, right? So you can change things like environment variables, um, scale, and different clusters. If you're managing multiple clusters um, with GitOps, um, you use customize. Um, question that came up um, a lot was, so what do I do with my secrets, right? So in Kubernetes, I'm using secrets, database connections, um, things like that, right? Usernames, passwords. I don't want to store that in Git. Um, Bitnami has something called sealed secrets that you can use. Is basically you're storing, you're actually are storing your your secrets in Git, but they're encrypted and they're decrypted on the platform, right? Um, that uh, there's also other tools that you can use for that. There's things like Vault, right? Uh, Ansible has uh, also a way to um, store um, encrypt those secrets. So um, you just need a, a management system to um, store your secrets. But you, yes, the answer to the question is yes, you do store your secrets. You just need some sort of management system. Um, and um, encrypting the secrets is uh, probably the best practice. Yes, question? Yes, uh, so if you go, uh, is it okay to repair the line items in one repository and just drop a single um, repo with the same environment? 
Yeah, so you can, um, so the, the idea is to keep track of what's going on in that, um, in, that, um, in that cluster itself or in that deployment itself. Yeah. And it changes the cluster spawn from environment to environment. Correct, correct, yeah. So you would have one main repository and different branches will then say, I have a branch called foo and I have, uh, sorry, I have a, pro, um, a repo called foo and I have a branch called prod, for example. I have another branch called dev. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the idea behind that. You have one. Deployment would be a deployment of um, of an applic uh, not the whole application stack. It, it could be, it actually depends, right? It depends how you, how you're designing your um, your application. But I see it as you'd have um, foo is one component of uh, one component of you know like microservices, right? Because you want to track those differently. Yes. You could use master branch. I don't normally use master branch. I, I use it. Um, I normally have branches um, depicting on where I am in the in the environment. I mean, you can you can use your master as your production. That's fine. Um, but I usually just branch them out differently. So. So again, like I said before, there's uh, there's two. Um, I guess. Before I said you can use any, any tool to reconcile those. Um, two of the biggest to, um, tool sets is Flux CD. Uh, Flux CD was uh, developed by the guys at Weaveworks and then they uh, donated it to the CNCF, right? So it's a CNCF project. Um, Argo is actually developed by the guys um, over to Intuit. Um, and um, that's, that's really the tool. So, Red Hat has been kind of just observing what's going on in GitOps. Um, GitOps has actually been around for a while. Um, it was really pioneered by the guys over at Weaveworks. Um, Red Hat was kind of monitoring, you know, what's going on, how that evolved, but um, eventually Red Hat is uh, settled on going to Argo. Um, we actually have an operator on Argo, so if you go to um, Operator Hub, um, you'll see there's a community version of Argo. Um, up there, I'm not sure. Are we? In, do you know if we're including Argo in in OpenShift eventually? Four to three to four. So yeah. So what we are um, um, we are going to include it in in um, uh, in OpenShift eventually. I'm not. I guess I'm not. I'm not 100 sure when, but we are um, going towards uh, Argo. So um, as soon as we decided we're going to Argo, this thing happened. Um, on November 14th, um, Weaveworks and Intuit uh, joined forces, um, and they created something called Argo Flux, right, is what they called it. I guess it's just a code name for now. I would have called it Fargo, but that's just me. Um, AWS also uh, did a joint announcement saying that they're getting involved in the project as well, so they're building a community around something they call the GitOps engine, right? Um, I, I attended the first meeting. What they really, really what GitOps Engine is, is that, okay, well we have the two different tools that do a lot of the same thing, right? They may, they may um, have different end user experience, but at, at its core, it's doing a lot of the same thing. So really they wanted um, to take any pre-existing functionality that's the same and just kind of, let's not duplicate code, is really what, what, what their, um, what their idea was. Uh, it's not intended, at least for now, to be like a, like a framework or anything like that. It's, it's really what they wanted to do is they wanted to create a library, right? So <laughs> essentially, right, GitOps Engine. All right, GitOps Engine, we have, um, uh, let's not duplicate code, we have all the similar code, let's make one code base, and then from that code base, then we'll branch off to our respective tools. Um, and that's what, first step, that's what they want to do now. Um, the idea eventually is to have some of these um, one tool to rule them all uh, sort of idea. Um, it's still in its infancy, so the idea is, is um, it might change. So they're still talking about how that's going to look like, how it's you know going to evolve from there. Who knows? So things are subject to change, but. Um, yeah, this is so new, it's still evolving, right? As I was building this presentation, they, they came out with this, um, you know, after Red Hat decided, okay, we're gonna do Argo, 
no, um, we've worked sent into a set, we're, we're joining forces, so um, we're still continuing monitoring that, so. I had a demo, so um, I had a demo to actually take up the rest of the time, so. Um, my laptop isn't working, and it's all in my laptop, so. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. So the yeah. So the question was is about Git workflow. Does, is a is a Git workflow um, with the different branches uh, the same, right, as you would in a development? Uh, the answer is yes, right. So you would make a change to your dev environment by doing a pull request in your dev, and you would have some sort of process uh, to promote that, right. So you'll have the dev branch then maybe deploys to the dev environment. It'll sync that up. You'll see that it works fine. There's some sort of um, uh, of approval process that goes through that, whatever that may be, and then that gets merged into, uh, let's say, staging, right, and then it'll continue on from that. So yes, so you, you would treat it like you would treat your code. Yes, question? So he's talking about uh, tests, right? So if, if I make a pull request, how do I um, uh, test a pull request? So ideally you would have um, a testing environment that you would uh, see those changes. So the, the, um, the, some of the things that you get when you do a, an application deployment, you also get when doing GitOps as well, right? So if you, for example, you say, I wanna scale my, uh, my infrastructure, I wanna add another node, for example, that would be a pull request. Um, that would go into your dev environment and if that goes horribly wrong, you can always uh, revert back. So you, you just use the same, the same process in Git. You, you, you leverage Git to do your, like your rollbacks or, um, or anything like that. Um, for your tests, it, your test could be anything. Um, really, whatever you uh, um, put into Jenkins is what you test. It's mostly you're testing the application stack, so you would just still test the application stack uh, to see that all that's fine, but you would do some tests as well um, for the infrastructure. Um, some of these tools do some testing for you a little bit, um, and we'll do some of the some of the rollbacks. I did have a demo for that, but um, technical difficulties. But did, did that answer your question at least a little bit? Uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so the secrets, um, as I, yeah, so here you, you would essentially encrypt them, right? So you would have, um, let's say, a config map with a username and password, let's just say, for example. Um, you would encrypt that with uh, some key that's already stored on the platform, and then you, inst you would uh, store the, uh, the garbled up, you know, um, config map in Git. So when, so when the sync happens, when that tool syncs it, it'll actually decrypt it and put it on the platform for you. So you would store your secrets um, encrypted on, on Git somewhere. And where is the key to decrypt the password? That would, that would be on the platform. Okay. So you would, it would already be on the platform. So yeah, so the, the, you'd have to have some sort of workflow. Um, that's why Bitnami uh, sealed secrets is good. You have to use some, some tool that would manage that for you. That would make it a lot easier. Yes, question. Oh, so the question was, is the sealed secrets a CRD of Argo CD? No, it's a sealed secrets is its own um, project uh, by a Bitnami. So that would be, it would be a CRD. In, but it, it's, it's, not, it's not like on Argo or, or Flux. It's, there, there are plugins for Flux for sealed secrets, just not on Argo. Cool, is there any other? We have eight minutes left. I can leave, let you guys go a little early. No more questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much.